So in 1970, uh, a Baptist um, young uh, layperson called Raymond Fung was uh, agonizing over what evangelism looked like in his home city of Hong Kong. And uh, he went one evening in 1970 to hear uh, a guest speaker um, from the States uh, who was talking about this thing called community organizing. The speaker was Saul Alinsky, the um, father, if you like, of community organizing. And uh, uh, Alinsky was not himself a Christian. He was an agnostic person of, of, of Jewish heritage. Um, but at this meeting, um, Alinsky talked about community organizing as a way of bringing change through partnerships, relationships, um, uh, and the sharing of power. And it struck um, Fung that that would work pretty well as a way of doing evangelism in Hong Kong as well. So he developed this uh, free stage process of uh, uh, evangelism in the style of community organizing. And he published a book called The Isaiah Vision. Uh, I mean, it's dated now. It was, you know, very much a, a product of the 70s. But uh, uh, if you ever um, see one in a secondhand bookshop, it sets out the process very clearly. Uh, stage one, the local congregation in partnership with other people pursues an agenda for justice. And uh, Fung called it the Isaiah agenda, drawing on Isaiah 65 verses 20 to 23. And we'll, we'll look at those verses in uh, uh, a bit more detail later on. But, but, but this is a vision of a world where children do not die, where old people live in dignity, where those that build houses live in them, where those who plant vineyards eat the fruit. In other words, um, uh, where uh, those that work have a fair share of the product of their labors. Um, a partnership with other organizations that are uh, um, pursuing similar goals. And then, said Fung, stage two is, very naturally, there will be the sharing of stories and invitations between the various partners. Um, so if you're in partnership with uh, uh, a secular group, a Buddhist group, whatever it might be in Hong Kong, uh, uh, a group of trade unions, naturally they're going to start sharing the story of what led them to have a passion for justice. And those from a Christian perspective are going to listen well um, to, um, uh, that, to those stories respectfully and indeed expect to learn from them. But equally, it, the, there will be a sharing of the story of why Christians do all this stuff. Um, and an invitation to attend worship, probably in, in both directions, um, that comes naturally out of relationships and particularly out of one-to-one -one conversations between the partners concerned. And then stage three, so stage um, one was the partnership for justice. Stage two was the sh story sharing between partners and um, invitation to, uh, to worship and to other events. Stage three takes more discernment. Stage three is where the Christian discerns where God is working in a person's life as you partner together for justice. 
um, that makes them ready to be invited to discipleship, to uh, encounter Jesus, and to, uh, to meet with and serve Jesus. Um, my own experience, and I was a vicar for 13 years, and actually there, there were a good number of people who came to a relationship with Christ to whatever language you want to use, but became disciples of Jesus who weren't disciples of Jesus before. But I can only think of one example in that whole time of somebody who came to, uh, as an adult, to put their trust in Jesus, who didn't come down this route. Um, it was it was people um, that God was was awakening something, um, but only when they got to work together with Christians with a similar passion did they discover that Jesus might be uh, the person that they are looking for. Um, uh, so so kind of. Um, four stories, um, if I may, along those lines. Uh, the first is from the Bible, and it's Cornelius. And you'll uh, remember that Cornelius in the book of Acts is um, uh, somebody whom uh, Peter comes to, to meet and tell about Jesus. But before Peter comes, an angel visits Cornelius and says... Uh, Cornelius, God has seen what you have given to the poor and to the synagogue, and therefore he's sending Peter with a message. And I mean, that's a bit puzzling, isn't it? Because it cannot possibly be that Cornelius um, somehow earned by his financial gifts the right to become a Christian. That, 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 that's not how it works. But I think it's like this. The angel had correctly discerned in Cornelius a heart that was being opened by the Holy Spirit. And the sign that Cornelius's heart was being opened by the Holy Spirit was that there was a newfound passion for justice and the poor in his life. You could tell that God was somehow becoming part of his life and and, and as I say I, I I found that over and over again really uh, there's a recent uh, report um, uh, by Theos and the Center for uh, Theology and Community uh, which points out that there is a correlation between churches that are involved in the struggle for social justice and numerical growth. It's not a simple correlation, but it's clearly there. Because why would you want, if you're not a Christian, to join an organization that doesn't care about things to which your heart is being opened? Um, it seems counterintuitive, and there are certainly some people who would say, actually, we shouldn't be concerned about social action and justice, we should spend all of our time uh, trying to, uh, and our energy, trying to bring more people into church. And yet it seems trying to bring more people into church doesn't correlate clearly with growing churches. Um, it does seem that something more like funds process is when churches tend to grow. So, so the first story was the story of um, Cornelius in the Bible. Second story is from um, uh, the Isaiah vision by Raymond Fung. And uh, he talks about uh, a group of um, young, largely in their twenties, um, textile workers, mostly young women. 
they worked in the same plant and occasionally would gather for an evening of fun. About Christmas time, although only two out of the 30 were Christians, the group decided to do something in inverted commas Christian. Uh, and they settled on looking at Luke's version of the first Christmas. The Christians were very excited. They got in touch with us and made a detailed study plan with background material and questions for discussion and so on. But nothing like that actually happened. Once the young women started reading Luke, most of them reading the Bible for the first time, they refused to follow our well thought out scheme. They were captured by one idea in the Christmas narrative that Mary, the mother of Jesus, in pregnancy, had to travel a long distance, risking her health and the life of her baby. That was the, fall, the point on which the young women's attention focused. They would not be drawn away. Immediately, they identified themselves with Mary. And like the mother of Jesus, they too had had the experience of having their health and their yet-to-be-born babies put at risk because of the need to stay on the job until the last possible day. They were fascinated that Mary had to go through the same hardship. I could see their eyes brighten up. Fung goes on to say that some of the Christians in the group had been hoping that they would tell Christian stories uh, to the group. And it turned out that the Christians did most of the listening. Uh, and the women were telling the stories of their experience and relating it to Mary. At the time, says Fung, labor legislation in Hong Kong provided for maternity leave, but without pay. So the law was totally meaningless. No working class woman could afford to claim the leave. As a matter of fact, many women workers in the late months of their pregnancy would work overtime in order to save enough to tide over the post-delivery period when they couldn't work. For the first time, these women realized that what they care about, God also cared about. So the solution was obvious, to fight for amendment to the existing law, to make the provision of maternity leave a paid provision. Thus began an organized effort by women workers to change the law. In 10 months, the law was changed to provide two thirds of the regular wages. It was a costly struggle in every sense. Many in the group de dedicated all their hours apart from work to rally support and visit hospitals and compile data and speak to the press and appear on television and present their case to lawmakers. A number dropped out and three gave up, gave up altogether. And when the young women gathered, there was sometimes tension between them. But there were many conversions. More than half of the group got baptized. The new converts were torn in their convictions. It was a costly struggle but soon the labor unions joined the drive and the League of Women Lawyers. The largest hospitals came out in support. In 10 months, the law was changed and many lives were changed also. And so the word of God came to a few vulnerable, powerless persons and transformed them into a people. They in turn were able to help the city discover that it had a soul. The Christian churches in general were too apathetic to read the signs. It took an encounter of a group of young women workers with the Gospel of Luke to bring out this piece of new reality. So, the conviction that God is present and at work empowers us. When we discern when the Holy Spirit is moving, we'll know where to be. third story um uh 
so uh, this is a story of, um, uh, I'll call him R, because uh, it's a real person and I'm anonymizing slightly, though I suspect he wouldn't mind at all me using his full name. Um, R was a local councillor in the area where I was a vicar. And R discovered that um, there was a need for a distribution of food and other essential items in the winter um, to those that needed it most. And, and he came to what to him was an un, um, uncomfortable conclusion that he did not know the poor in the parish. And it seemed like the church did. Some of them were very much part of us. Uh, but others of us, like me, I guess, um, very much middle class, not sharing in the experience of the poor, but commonly in their homes um, and knowing some of the structures of, of, of who was influential and uh, perhaps who had the, uh, the, the, the networks um, of those with need. So, quite uh, openly, he asked if he could join the church simply in order to get, you know, get involved in what we were doing uh, for the cause of justice and in order to meet the people that, that were part of this process. And we said, of course. Um, he uh, um, started to attend church and and, and and some other meetings as well. And along the way, he built relationships with Christians who previously he had discounted as a force for good in society. It, it wasn't he didn't believe in God, it's just that he didn't think church was much use and never saw any point in becoming part of one. And one day, um, uh, came to the point, having been with us for a while and got to know us quite well, where he asked if he could make a commitment of faith. I said, of course, we prayed together. I, I talked him through what repenting and believing meant. He was confirmed, uh, he joined the electoral roll, and he's now a member of a new monastic community. Uh, he and I are, are, are prayer partners. But it didn't start with me knocking on his door and saying, can I tell you about Jesus, please? It started with a church that was willing to put a concern for justice and the poor at the center of what it was doing. Um, and a final story in this section. Um, this is a story where we're anonymizing, so I, I, I called the, the, the previous person I was talking about R, so uh, uh, now let me uh, talk about somebody I will call B. Um, soon after the death of his father, be moved to a city to begin work as a community organizer and soon found that although he was not himself a person of faith his greatest allies were church pastors who kept inviting him to worship with them and he politely declined uh, in his own words quote i would shrug and play the quest question off for while i believed in the sincerity i heard in their voices I remained a reluctant skeptic, wary of expedient conversion, aware of having too many calls with God to be easily won. And yet, without a vessel for my beliefs, without an unequivocal commitment to a particular community of faith, I knew I would be consigned at some level always to remain apart, free in the way that my mother was free, 
built ultimately alone in the same way as she was ultimately alone. End of the quotation. So finally, he slipped into the church of one of his pastor friends. Uh, at eight, it was an eight o'clock um, service uh, on a Sunday morning. And he heard a service, uh, he heard a sermon that would change his life. It was called The Audacity of Hope. And it spoke of the slender hopes of Hannah, the mother of Samuel. By the end of the sermon, B was in tears and convinced that he would one day join with this church and this people. But in his own words, he was not yet a Christian. That didn't happen until some months later, after church attendance had become normal to him. And in his words, quote, my coming home to God came after my coming home to a community. And it came about as a choice and not an epiphany. Kneeling beneath that cross, I felt God's spirit beckoning me. I submitted myself to his will and dedicated myself to discovering his truth. Uh, so I've called him B, but he is quite famous. Does anyone know? Um, the person whose conversion story I've been telling. Barack well, Obama. That was Barack Obama, absolutely, who went on to be the 44th president of the United States. Um, and very conveniently um, produces almost exactly the, the, the paradigm that I've been suggesting, um, that it starts with a shared commitment to justice and the common good uh, through partnership and relationship and the sharing of power. Then there's the listening to the stories and telling the stories and, and finding a place in the community and attending worship. And then, for some, not for all, and we can't force it and, and make it happen. There will be those in whom questions are provoked, um, who, who, who start to ask for the reason, for the hope that, with it, that is within the people of God. Uh, and for those people, one by one, a journey of discipleship may begin. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and uh, here are the words from Isaiah that made such a difference to Raymond Fun. Um, I should tell, I, I guess I should talk a little bit more about Raymond Fung's story, by the way. Uh, Raymond Fung, he was, uh, um, as I say, uh, uh, a, a Baptist lay person in Hong Kong, but he rose to be um, uh, senior, to be the senior leader within the World Council of Churches. Uh, and together with um, Robert Runcie, who was then the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, they launched what was called the Decade of Evangelism. The Decade of Evangelism turned into something very different from the Isaiah agenda. Uh, but at its start, this was what it was about, about uh, partnership for justice. So uh, I'm going to be quiet for a little bit. And uh, together, we're just going to muse on these verses of Isaiah. Um, it talks about a new world. And it says, never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered a curse. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. 
For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. 